time here at Stirling Castle. But there it is. But I'm not going inside. My boyfriend is having an interview. And I'm just hanging around, so it's nice of you. Should I follow this path, maybe? That's what we're planning to do later on. Go to the Wallace Monument. Look at these colours. I ended up on Gowan Hill, which used to be a hill fort. And just as I was filming, I got a phone call from my boyfriend saying that because he had an interview, he was uh, able to go into the castle for free and I was able to come with him, so I thought, well, why not take the opportunity and do a little bit of filming? So, here we are at Stirling Castle. So, as you have seen earlier, it is on a rather steep rock, so it has a really strong defensive position and it was really sought after and it changed hands quite frequently. During the Wars of Independence alone, it changed hands eight times. The oldest part is roughly from the 12th century. They haven't really found archaeological evidence for any earlier settlements, even though it may have also been a hillfort. But the present buildings are mostly dating between 1490 and 1600. It used to be a traditional coronation place of Scottish kings, including Mary Queen of Scots, who was crowned here in 1542. And in fact, she also would have grown up here as a very young child before she was sent to France. Alexander I died here in 1124, and he dedicated a chapel here in 1110. However, under his successor, David I, Stirling I became a royal borough and an important centre for administration. There was a lot going on, so for example, in 1296, Edward I of England invaded Scotland and this started the Wars of Independence and he wanted to have uh, dominion over Scotland, he wanted Scotland to be a vassal state to England. The English occupied the castle, then lost it during the Battle of uh, Stirling Bridge, they regained it during the Battle of Falkirk and they lost it again and they just keep going back and forth. Robert the Bruce became King of Scotland, but only after the death of Edward I was he finally able to end the Wars of Independence. Once the warring period was over and there was um, a more stable political climate, the Scottish kings would use this as their main residence. So for example, the widow of James I took refuge here after her husband was murdered, with her young son who would become King James II. So then James III was born here at Stirling Castle. And James IV built the Great Hall and renovated the Chapel Royal. And the Chapel Royal was usually used for coronations. James V, as a young boy, was crowned at Chapel Royal after his father's premature death at the Battle of Flodden. And James V was the one who built the Royal Palace. Now he unfortunately died young and left his wife, Marie de Guise, with the young Mary Queen of Scots in charge. Here you can see some of the famous uh, unicorn tapestries.
So after the union of crowns in 1603, the son of Mary Queen of Scots, James II of Scotland, had become James I of England and he left to London to rule at the English court and after this Stirling Castle stopped being a royal residence as much and became more of a military base and also prison with just a few occasional royal visits. There was a little bit of activity during the Jacobite uprisings of 1715 and 1745-46. However, from 1800 onwards, it was owned by the War Office and it was turned mostly into barracks. The Great Hall was altered to hold accommodation and had extra floors put in. The Chapel Royal became a lecture theatre and dining hall. The Royal Palace became the officers' mess. Once they decided that they were going to open it up to the public, they started the restorations of putting it all back together. It cost them about 12 millions to do that. In the summer of 2011, the restorations of the royal lodgings were completed, and between 2002 and 2015, the unicorn tapestries were recreated, which you can see in the royal palace. So, because of this, all the inside decoration that you see is a recreation rather than being original, but the buildings from the outside, they are as they would have been built. Now, it was a military base until 1964, however, it still counts as the headquarter of the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders Regiment and they also have a museum at the Durham Castle. So incidentally, while we were there, there was a lot of uh, military around as well and at first we were puzzled what was going on. Later on it turned out that it was the birthday of Prince Charles and so we also experienced a little military display including firing the cannons which were really quite loud so I turned down the volume for you. I thought this was a very interesting photographic exhibition and I just love looking at Scottish castles so I thought I would include this as well. And this is a little bit about the process of recreating those tapestries.
and you can just see how much work must have gone into making these. to the Wallace Monument. Who knows? on our way to the bus station to get the bus out to the Wallace Monument and on our way we are passing Stirling Bridge which is a stone bridge but there used to be another wooden bridge further upstream and this wooden bridge was the site of the Battle of the Bridge of Stirling which was on the 11th of September 1297 and it was fought by Andrew Moray and the hero William Wallace and their army managed to defeat the English forces and it was all to do with this wooden bridge which was a key entry point to the north of Scotland. The bridge was narrow and made from wood and it was the only river crossing nearby. So the English army started to cross and only two horses side by side could cross at one time. Meanwhile, the army of uh, William Wallace and Andrew Murray were waiting up on Abbey Crag, which is where the Wallace Monument stands. And they had a very good view of the plains below. And so they were waiting for a decent amount of the English army to come over. They made sure that it was just enough men that they could comfortably defeat them. And then they swooped down on them and cut off any more men coming across the bridge. And because the bridge was so narrow, the English army on the other side could basically only watch and couldn't come to the rescue. So as a result, the confidence of the remaining English army was shaken and they retreated and destroyed the bridge. Andrew Murray died, but William Wallace continued to terrorize the English until he was defeated in summer 1298 and executed. So this is a viewpoint, but it's not much of a viewpoint anymore. It's all grown over. It wasn't until the 19th century, however, that they decided to build a monument for him. And it was mainly due to writers such as uh, Sir Walter Scott, who created a resurgence of Scottish national identity with their novels. The foundation stone was laid in 1861, but it wasn't completed until 1869. And that's our day coming to an end. We are waiting for a train back home. So thank you once again for watching and hopefully I will see you for the next video as well.